Now let's get to the practical application. We'll start with the snake dragon that guards the golden apples of the Hesperides. In Greek mythology, Leiden is a great serpent dragon often depicted as coiled around the tree of Hera that holds the golden apples. And this is located on the far western edge of the world. And that's important because of the symbolism of the edge of the margin, right? Uh, the further away from the ordered center of civilization you get, the more chaos you get. And that's why it's on the edge of the world, at least in part. So the golden apples of the Hesperides, however you say that, bear a striking resemblance to the golden apples in Norse mythology. Both of these apples, both of these golden apples, they're beautiful to behold, they're solid gold, and they grant immortality. Of course, there's similarities here with the tree of knowledge in Eden and, and the, the tree of life that would give immortality in Eden as well. And the snake there who tells Eve to eat the fruit and become like the gods, the Elohim. So here we have an apple version of the elixir of life, basically, which represents the fountain of living water from the Christ, from the Logos. That is salvation, sozo, everlasting life, and what Carl Jung would call individuation. So salvation that you can only attain by defeating the serpent of chaos, if that sounds familiar, right? He shall bruise your heel and you shall crush his head. Another paraphrase, but that was basically a prophetic word about Christ from God himself, that Christ as the second Adam, the perfect Adam, would have his heel bruised by the serpent and he would crush his head. So snakes and dragons can represent in part, as we've covered in part at least, the darker aspects of the psyche, shadow archetypal energies, you could say. Jung said that the shadow is often represented in dreams by the serpent and by the dragons or the serpent dragon, and it occupies multiple levels of ontological reality. So we detect this pattern at the level of the individual psyche, where the snakes are representative of the various archetypal energies of the individual's shadow up to the level of the family, right? A family unit has a collective shadow. And then you can take it up to the next level, um, the level of the nation, and then finally to the level of the cosmos. The shadow of an individual is powerful to the individual. And, you know, even at the level of the family, it's power. One person's shadow is very powerful within that family, as is the rest of their psyche. And it does, in fact, affect the collective, right? There's this bottom up effect of each individual person on the collective, all the way up to the nation, all the way up to the world. But its power and effect are, of course, weaker the higher up you go in, in terms of, of levels. So my shadow affects me very powerfully but affects the nation of America to a lesser degree. But take a million of me, right? A million individuals and unite them, bind them together under one identity, that being, in this case, the United States of America. And now you have a very, very powerful collective and collective shadow. But then at the level of the cosmos, so pre-modern pre humans would describe something even higher and more powerful using language like angels, demons, gods, uh, God, capital G, the Christ. The snake at this highest level we can conceptualize is often more dragon-like in appearance. So you have the Leviathan, for example, in the scriptures. You have the Jormungandr in Norse mythology, right? That dr great dragon at the bottom of the ocean that encircles the entire globe. And you have also the flying burning ones, right? That's what this seraph means. Uh, of, uh, the, the seraphim, which are seen nearest the throne of God in the Bible and also in the Book of Enoch. And they're described as burning uh, having multiple wings, many eyes, and in some depictions and descriptions, they're flying serpents, right? And there are other uh, beings in ancient 
uh, e Egyptian and Mesopotamian uh, mythology that closely resemble these seraphim. It's very interesting. Um, and in the wilderness, in the scriptures, they're depicted as fiery serpents, right? This is the same word, seraph. And Isaiah also uses the singular seraph to describe a fiery flying serpent in line with the other uses of this term throughout the Tanakh. And then, of course, at the very highest cosmological level, we have the Logos, the Christ, who is said to have become a serpent. He became the snake, becoming the curse and the ultimate scapegoat to save humanity. And we'll go into that in just a moment here. How do you defeat the serpent in your life? Ultimately, by taking up your cross and following the logos. But there's much more. What does that mean, first off? What does that mean symbolically? What does that mean psychologically? It means a number of things, and we've covered this a lot in past videos. But let's... Let's dig into the union of opposites side of things and the elixir of life, kind of the alchemical side. Pliny recounted that um, the battle between the dragon and the elephant, this would it would end with the snake wrapping its coils around the heavy elephant, and it starts sucking the blood out of the elephant. But And the elephant grows weak, collapses, and crushes the serpent, which is basically a dragon, as a serpent dragon. And they both die. And the hot blood from one mingles with the cold blood from the other. And this merging of the blood. This is an alchemical metaphor for the combining of heavy mercury and burning sulfur, which ultimately creates the elixir of life. Christ ultimately crushed the head of the serpent by dying on the cross, by sacrificing ultimately. And this is where we get to the alchemical battle of the elephant and the serpent dragon. But first, St. Gregory of Nyssa said in the life of Moses, if sin is a serpent and the Lord became sin, the Lord meaning Christ, it must be obvious to all that in becoming sin, he became a serpent, which is simply another name for sin. And remember, sin means to miss the mark, right? That's what that original Hebrew word, Hebrew word meant. He became a serpent for our sin. Excuse me. He became a serpent for our sake so that he could consume and destroy the serpents of Egypt brought to life by the sorcerers. Once he had done this, he was changed into a staff again. And by this staff, sinners are chastised and those who are climbing the difficult ascent of virtue are supported. With good hope, they lean upon the staff of faith, since faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Those who attain an understanding of these mysteries become gods in comparison with people who resist the truth. On the other hand, those who receive strength from the light and great power and authority over their enemies are like well-trained athletes, stripping to confront their opponents with courage and confidence. They hold in their hands the staff, which is the teaching of faith. And by that staff, they will conquer the serpents of Egypt. And so that's the secret. So how do we create this elixir of life? How do we defeat and overcome the serpents in our unconscious minds, in our shadow? How do we, uh, outside of our shadow, in the external world, how do we defeat those serpents, those dragons there behind which are gold? So the secret to conquering the serpents representing the dark, dangerous aspects or archetypal energies of your individual uh, psyche, your unconscious mind, or the collective is the staff. The staff is its kryptonite. This staff represents faith, that is, pistis, right? Trust, faith, belief, and trust specifically in the highest thing we can conceptualize, which Heraclitus, St. John, Carl Jung, Jonathan Banjo, uh, Jordan Peterson, and we all call the Logos, the Christ. This faith, 
This trust joins the heart and the mind with the logos. It binds them together in the same way it binds together spouses, families, and nations. When you remember the logos in that way throughout the day, you're returning in that moment to the center. You're looking up to the cross. Remember, the cross is the sign of, of the center, right? The, um, up at the serpent on the pole, like the Israelites in the desert, who were saved and healed, made whole by looking at that symbol. And they were saved from the serpents. When Christians partake in the Eucharist or communion, they're embodying this pattern in the highest way they can conceptualize. That's the idea behind this, at least in part. This is the joining of the masculine in the form of Christ, the Logos, and the feminine, you, or the church, the body, right? That's the idea here. The church is called the bride of Christ in the Bible. Uh, Christ is called the bridegroom. Um, so you are joining the masculine and the feminine. The, you're joining heaven and earth through the sacrificing of your time, your attention, your devotion, energy. This joining of the opposites is called taking up your cross in the scriptures. It's, it's called crucifying the flesh, putting off the old self and putting on the new self. These are all very closely related in the scriptures. So the spirit of the Logos is the living water which the alchemists called the elixir of life, which is created by joining the masculine sulfur and the feminine mercury. Sulfur represents the dragon. Mercury represents the elephant. Symbolically, this is the bride and Christ, the serpent or dragon. Uh, by the way, in, in the Hebrew Bible, Yahweh is sometimes depicted as a dragon-like being that breathes smoke from its nostrils and fire from its mouth. So even the Father God, the Creator God, Yahweh, he is depicted sometimes as this dragon-like uh, entity. Now, the method to create, quote-unquote, or more accurately, invoke and drink the elixir of life is to remember the logos, right? It starts with memory. Remember the, the Christ. Remember the logos and thus return to that center and bind yourself to it by trusting it. Um, and it's, it's, it's not just a matter of trust. It has to do with sacrificing time and energy, but also it's, it's also a devotional sort of thing. Like you're, it's a reverential thing, right? You're trusting that it is the source of everything. It is the highest truth and life, the ultimate banner to unify and organize the multiplicity of the archetypes within beneath. That's that's still a lower level of this pattern. Of course, you have a, the, the highest version of this. The big distinction to make here, uh, Jung saw this as the archetype of the self. The Christ was the archetype of the self, as God was the archetype of the self to him, at least in part. But, of course, to believers, this is the source, capital S, of everything. This is God, right? The, the God-man in the form of the Christ. In Jungian psychology, this is all deeply meaningful symbolism revealing archetypal realities and patterns of individuation. And to the believer, that individuation is something more. It's called sanctification or theosis or deification, salvation. To many believers, this is not just a one-time event, but a continual process of uniting heaven and earth, God and human uh, yeah, so that's how Christ defeats the serpent. He sacrifices the most, the greatest thing he can possibly sacrifice, which is his perfect, pure, uh, perfectly righteous life. But there's more than one way to go about this, 